Welcome to Abundant Life Christian Fellowship. We're so glad you've joined us for today's message. Let's dive in. Good morning, good morning. It's great to be with you this morning. Hey, we are in our sermon series journey. We are considering what does it mean to follow Jesus? So we're focused on that topic. We're looking at the Gospel of Luke to see what, that, what, what it entails. And one of the things we're going to see as we look at our passage today is that following Jesus requires faith. But what is faith? What is faith? Why do you need it? How do you get it? Those are some of the questions I hope to answer for you this morning. If you would turn with me to Luke 7, verse 1, if you have a Bible, we're going to be uh, looking at the first 10 verses. We're going to be looking at the faith of a Roman centurion. If you have no idea what that is, that's okay, I'll tell you what it is. And then we're going to look at the faith of a sinful, that's what the Bible says, woman. So some good stuff. There are some gold nuggets here. So Luke 7, verses 1 through 10, let me read them to you. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, he entered Capernaum. There a centurion servant, whom his master valued highly, was sick and about to die. The centurion heard of Jesus and sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly. This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. He was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent returned to the house and found the servant well. So this passage ends with Jesus saying some remarkable things about this Roman centurion. Uh, What's a Roman centurion? Well, Roman centurion was a soldier in the Roman military, and they were in charge of a sentry, which was roughly 80 to 100 soldiers. They were usually seasoned soldiers who had risen through the, the ranks due to their courage due to their discipline, due to their experience and their leadership skills. And Roman centurions were often people of means. They had money. And to climb the ranks in the Roman military and to climb the political ranks, Roman centurions would often do things to serve the community with their money. And what we see here in this passage is this Roman centurion doing what? He's building a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue, for the people that he's kind of in charge of, as he is a Roman military person in charge of this area where Jews lived. And so this is who we meet, and and we meet this guy, and he's got this sick servant that is about to die, a servant that he valued greatly. And this Roman centurion expresses an amazing faith, so much so that Jesus is like, look, there's nobody else like this guy in terms of his faith. So what made his faith so great? What made his faith so great? Let's check it out. His pursuit, his courage, his humility, his confidence. Let's consider the centurion's pursuit. Verse 3 tells us that the centurion had heard about Jesus. It's uncertain what the centurion knew about Jesus. We don't know for sure, but we, it's implied that this centurion at least knew that Jesus was a healer and that he had a, a very a great authority. And so 
what does the centurion do? He's like, oh my goodness, I got to find this Jesus because my, my servant is sick. I've got to get to Jesus. And so he talks to elders in the area that were elders of the Jews. And he's like, well, they, may, they must know how to get to Jesus. And he talks to them and he ends up getting, finding his way to Jesus through the Jewish elders. You see, the centurion was seeking Jesus. He was going after him. Great faith fervently pursues Jesus. Great faith fervently pursues Jesus. Let's consider the centurion's courage. So the centurion likely worked for Herod Antipas. And the reason I tell you this, because this is the same Herod that he was a puppet king for the Romans So he was over the area of Capernaum, and we have the centurion working for him. This is the same Herod that is about to kill John the Baptist, and in Luke 13, he will seek to kill Jesus. And so this centurion going to Jesus, he's risking his whole career. He's risking his whole career. His boss isn't going to like this. You see the courage of the centurion going and pursuing Jesus. You see, this man's job and his reputation was on the line if he would seek after Jesus, but yet he has the courage to do it. Great faith seeks Jesus even at the risk of personal loss. Great faith seeks Jesus even at the risk of personal loss. Let's consider the centurion's uh, humility. Let's look at this. Once Jesus is on his way to the centurion, the centurion starts having second thoughts. And did something change in Jesus' worthiness where he's like, oh, maybe Jesus isn't this healer who has this authority? No, nothing changed in the centurion's perspective of Jesus, but he had this new awareness that, oh my goodness, Jesus is coming, and I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. My worthiness compared to his worthiness makes me unworthy. And so he's like, I don't deserve to have Jesus even come under my roof. He's aware of his unworthiness before Jesus. He has a humility about him. You know, here's a guy, most likely a man of influence, a man of character, a man of wealth and great compassion. We see it with his servant, probably generous. We know he's generous to the Jewish people, and yet he's like, look, I'm having this realization that I am not even worthy to have Jesus step in my house. You see, great faith understands that even at our best, We are morally and spiritually bankrupt compared to Jesus, making us undeserving of his help. We see the centurion's humility, and yet, next, we see his confidence. His confidence. One commentator said that the centurion was confident that Jesus had such authority that a word from Jesus would do to the disordered world of sickness and death what a word from a Roman officer does in a disordered and rebellious society. Jesus need only say the word and the servant would be healed. This centurion was so confident in Jesus' ability to heal He didn't even believe Jesus had to be in the same location as his sick servant. He was confident in in what Jesus could do. You see, great faith places its trust in Jesus' loving mercy and ability to handle what is beyond your capacity. And we can put it all together. What made the centurion's faith great? The centurion pursued Jesus at the risk of personal loss with deep humility and great confidence in Jesus' ability to handle what was beyond his capacity. You see, your faith is only as good as its object. And great faith in um, something in the world 
that Billy was talking about earlier, whether it's your career that you're trusting to bring you the satisfaction and security and, and significance that you crave, whether it's a, a, a romantic relationship, whether it's your children, whether it's a certain hobby, whether it's drugs or alcohol, right? These things will ultimately fail you. Who knows what the centurion was putting his faith in before he came to place his faith in Jesus? Maybe it was him climbing in the political ranks, climbing in the military, climbing in power and influence. But what happens when you encounter a situation that the thing you're putting your faith in can't do anything about like your sick servant? Then what? You see, a little faith in Jesus is way better than a great faith in anything else. A little faith in Jesus is better than great faith in anything else because it's more about the object of your faith than the quality of your faith. Let's look at the faith of a sinful woman. Verse 36. When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman is she. He would know what kind of woman she is, and she's a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii. In the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house, Simon. You did not give me water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown, but whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. One thing I really appreciate about the Bible is that if you know nothing about the historical context of the passages you're reading, it still can make sense and it can still hit you and it can still resonate with you. But I tell you, if you understand, the more you understand the historical and cultural, cultural context of the passage you're reading, oh my goodness, it even comes alive in fresh and whole new ways. This passage is no exception. I'm going to be drawing heavily on a book by a Bible scholar named Kenneth Bailey. He's now with Jesus, but he wrote a book called Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, Cultural Studies in the Gospels. Um, and as a scholar and a missionary, from the time he was little, he grew up in Middle Eastern culture. And his insight, oh my goodness, just brings this alive in a whole new way. And I want to share some of those insights with you. First of all, the first thing I want you to see is that Simon the Pharisee intentionally and severely disrespected Jesus. Severely and intentionally. Through major shade on Jesus. Look, 
Every culture has a customary way of welcoming a guest, right? Here in, here in America, if you're coming to a house and a person's being a good host, they're going to say, hey, it's great to see you as you're coming in. They're probably going to go outside the door. They're probably going to give you a hug. How are you? And they're going to help you bring some stuff inside. And oh, when you get inside, hey, can I get you a drink? Um, hey, why don't you sit here? right? If somebody, uh, you know, you went to somebody's house and they come out the door and they're just like, you again? Are you serious? What are you doing here? Why did you come? That would, have been, that would be such a disrespectful welcome, right? It would be a total insult. Now, this is essentially what Simon did to Jesus in our passage, Look at what Bailey uh, says about this. As Jesus entered the house, all the traditional courtesies were omitted. Custom required a kiss of greeting, usually on the face. That's what you did in this culture. After the guests were seated on stools around the broad U-shaped dining couch, water and olive oil would be brought for the washing of hands and feet. Olive oil, very present in this area. Only then could the, the, the grace be offered. Finally, the guests would re recline on the couch and the meal would begin. The minimum Jesus could expect would have been a kiss of greeting, a little water for his feet. Remember, they didn't have like closed to toe shoes, dusty environment, sandals, right? Little water for his feet, some olive oil with which to wash and anoint himself. Olive oil was and is available in every home. In the story, the omission of these three courtesies is mentioned specifically by Jesus. No one in the room could have failed to observe their omission. When these common acts of welcome were omitted, Jesus had the full right to say, I see I am not welcome here and leave flushed with anger, but this is not the way he responded. So major intentional disrespect by Simon the Pharisee as he's welcoming Jesus into his home. And guess what? There's another guest there as well who's uninvited. And this uninvited guest was not even given a name in our passage, probably because she was viewed as trash by her community. She was known in the town as one who lived a sinful life meaning she didn't occasionally sin, like she lived sin, like she, it was, sin was her way of life. The widely held interpretation of this sinful woman was that she was a prostitute. And like the centurion, look at how she is pursuing Jesus. Everybody in the town knew what she was about, and what she has done. She was known throughout the town. And this woman, she is fervently pursuing Jesus. This woman had heard previously Jesus' message of grace for sinners. She heard it, she repented, she believed, she received it. And she had to find Jesus to thank him. She had to find him so that she could personally thank him. And so she hunts Jesus down. She gets to him. The sinful woman had great faith that fervently pursued Jesus. Let's look at what else her faith consisted of. Check this out. Like the centurion, the sinful woman had a courageous faith. She struggled to find Jesus, and then once she did, she has a new barrier, a new problem on her hands. Jesus is in the home of Simon the Pharisee. Pharisees were Jewish religious leaders who took great care to avoid women like her that they considered unclean. If they would engage and, and be with a woman like that for a meal, it could totally destroy their social standing, and so they did whatever they could to avoid women like this. The sinful woman knew she couldn't be more unwelcome in this house. And yet, 
she courageously goes into Simon's house. Why? Because she has to get to Jesus. She is desperate to get to Jesus to thank him. And when she goes in, she has this alabaster jar of perfume, which was really expensive. And most likely, she's going in to anoint Jesus' hands and his head. She doesn't have a plan to wash his feet or his hands because she didn't bring a towel or a jar of water. She must have assumed that the host would have followed the common courtesies and would have those things readily available for Jesus. But when she sees Jesus completely insulted by Simon, she is grieved to the point where tears start flowing out of her eyes. And she's thinking, how on earth can they treat this man this way? And she's filled with this righteous anger, and she basically says, not on my watch. If you're not going to give him the courtesies that he's due, then I will do it myself. Talk about courage. Talk about courage. You see, great faith seeks Jesus even at the risk of personal loss. And you know what? This woman didn't risk personal loss. She experienced personal loss because that alabaster jar of perfume she had was probably worth a year, a year's salary. A year's salary. A year's salary. She's pouring a year's salary on Jesus. It wasn't at the risk of personal loss. It was at the experience of personal loss. What an act of humility. And she doesn't have a towel, and she doesn't have water, so what is she to do? Boom, she has an idea. I will use my tears as the water, and I will use my hair as the towel. His feet are getting washed. And so she gets down, and feet were considered defiled, nasty, unclean, you know, and here she is, washing Jesus' feet. What an act of humility. And just so you know, the act of this sinful woman letting her hair down, oh, major taboo in this culture. You didn't do this. Bailey states, in traditional Middle East society, a bride on her wedding night lets down her hair and allows it to be seen by her husband for the first time. No one around the room could have missed the overtones of this woman's gesture. By unloosing her hair, she is making some form of an ultimate pledge of loyalty to Jesus. Look at this woman's faith. She had great faith that pursued Jesus, not just at the risk of personal loss, but at personal loss. This sinful woman exhibited profound faith characterized by humility, pushing, positioning herself at Jesus' feet as a servant and a slave. And then the sinful woman exhibited a faith that was full of confidence in Jesus. She confidently went to Jesus knowing that he would receive her and wouldn't reject her. That he would welcome her. Even though she was doing something completely socially taboo. Great faith pursues Jesus at the risk of personal loss with deep humility and great confidence in Jesus to do what is beyond your capacity. Do you have this faith in Jesus? Let's talk about you now. Do you have this faith in Jesus? If you have faith in Jesus, what is the quality of your faith? A little faith in Jesus goes a long, long way, way better than no faith. But wouldn't we like our faith to grow? Wouldn't we like it to develop to the point that we are unshakable? That no matter what life throws at our way, we are so cemented on the unchanging rock of, on, of Jesus that we bend, but we don't break. 
Do you want that kind of faith? It's available. How do we get it? How do we acquire great faith? Well, faith is a gift from God. And so how do you get this faith as a gift from God? How do you receive great faith from Jesus? Well, like the centurion and the sinful woman, the first step is to go to Jesus. Go to him. Go just as you are. Go with your brokenness. Go with your questions. Go with your doubts. You know, in between the account of the centurion and the sinful woman, I didn't read it, but it's an account of John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, he sends his disciples to to Jesus because he's like, look, Jesus, I'm having questions about you. I'm I'm having my doubts. By the way, John the Baptist is Jesus' cousin. He grew up from the time he, he was little, knowing that Jesus was the Messiah, God's special deliverer, the Savior of the world. And yet, here he is, he's like, I don't know. And so what does John do? He sends his disciples to go to Jesus with his doubts. John says through his disciples, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Oh my goodness. And did Jesus tear John to pieces for doubting? No. Jesus explained to John's disciples so they could report back to John that his actions provided proof that he was the Messiah. And then look at what Jesus said about John next. In verse 7, 28, I tell you, among those born of a woman, there, of women, there is no one greater than John. Evidently, it is possible to be a great person and a great follower of Jesus and have doubts about Jesus. Do you have doubts this morning? Are you unsure about Jesus? Are you unsure about this Christian faith? Guess what? You're in the right place. Bring all your doubts. Bring all your questions. Bring them. So the first step to get great faith is to go to Jesus. Go to Jesus with your brokenness, your fears, your problems, and your doubts, and say to Jesus, please give me faith, and then make it grow into great faith. I want to believe, Jesus. Help my unbelief. That's the first step. Here's the second step to receiving great faith from Jesus. Meditate on Jesus' words and actions. The more we come to Jesus and we spend time with him and we understand who he is, what he's done, and why he's done it, and what he promises to do, the more our our trust in Jesus grows. And you especially want to pay, uh, pay special attention to his death and resurrection, what he accomplished there. The more the centurion and the sinful woman and John the Baptist meditated on Jesus, his words, his actions, their faith grew. Here's the third step to receiving great faith from Jesus. Start obeying him. Start obeying him. I think a lot of us think that we have to have great faith before we obey. Oh, no. You start obeying, and then that's when the great faith comes. You see, the more you obey Jesus, the more you experience that he truly is the way, the truth, and the life. And a big part of obeying Jesus is doing things that scare you, that terrify you. But when you experience Jesus as a power enabling you to do the things that absolutely bring horror to you, oh my goodness, your faith grows Do you think the centurion's faith grew by seeking Jesus and his healing touch for his servant at great risk to his social standing? Absolutely. He put himself in a position where it could all go horribly wrong if Jesus didn't enact. Are you putting yourself in those situations? If you're not, your faith is going to remain small. Do you think that the sinful woman's faith grew? Do you think she had more faith before she entered into Simon the Pharisee's house or after? At risk 
of being shamed and humiliated by Simon and his guests and pouring out the expensive perfume? Did she have more faith before or after she entered the house? After. You see, Obeying Jesus moves the trustworthiness of Jesus from your head to your heart. It provides you with not only intellectual understanding of Christ's goodness, but also a firsthand experience of it. When my boys were little, and we're going to wrap it up here. When my boys were little, right, and maybe you've experienced this with your kids, um, you know, where you're at the pool, right? And those, those little guys, right, they're on the edge of the pool, and you're in the water, and you're telling them, hey, jump in, I'll catch you. They can't swim, right? And they're terrified, right? And they finally muster up the courage to jump into your arms, right? Before that, it's like, I know you're going to catch me dead, right? Because you love me and you're telling me you'll catch me. There's this intellectual belief that I will catch them. But it's not until they jump into my arms and they feel me, my strength holding them up above the water, that the intellectual knowledge becomes real to their heart and becomes an experiential knowledge that, yes, my dad is truly, my father is truly mighty to save. Same, same with God. If you routinely put yourself into situations where if God doesn't show up, it's all going to go horribly wrong, and you see his mighty hand doing what only he can do, oh my goodness, the faith. You can become a person of great faith that pursues Jesus at the risk of personal loss with deep humility and great confidence in Jesus' ability to do what is beyond your capacity. Go to him. Spend time with him by meditating on his words and actions. Obey him even when it's scary. And here's the remarkable thing about Jesus. One of the things. You know the reason why he can give us great faith? Why Jesus can do that? Here's the remarkable reason why he can do it. He can provide great faith to us <laughs> because of his profound trust in his heavenly father, which compelled him to carry out the most terrifying, horrific act ever performed all for you. You see, as Jesus was in the garden, he's contemplating the horrors of the cross and he's sweating drops of blood Look at the trust in his heavenly father. Look at the faith in his heavenly father when he says, yes, you know, if there's a way for this cup to pass from me, but not my will, father, your will be done. What radical faith Jesus exhibited. And then when he's on the cross and he's just before he breathes his last, what does Jesus say to the father? Into your hands I commit my spirit. You want to talk about trust and faith? You see, meditate on Jesus, on him undertaking the greatest challenge on your behalf. Look at how he drank the cup of your sin penalty so you wouldn't have to. Meditate on his faith in his Father, expressed an unwavering, scary obedience. Meditate on his courage and you'll find courage. Meditate on his faith and your faith will grow. Meditate on him doing the hardest thing for you and you will be able to do hard things for him. I think you can trust a person that, would, that was willing to go through the cross for you. How our world needs more people that are filled with great faith. The world will be changed. Will you be one of those people? This morning, we're going to take communion. And it's a tangible reminder of the enormous lengths that Jesus went to so that we could receive great faith. So our sins could be forgiven. So we could be adopted into God's family, reconciled to the Father, given a new identity, a new purpose, a new family, a new future, a new power. And so as we take communion, we're going to do it 
Um, during this last song, you're free to go to the table as you feel led. But this table is for people that have placed their trust in Jesus. Even no matter how little that faith feels right now, it's for people that have trusted their life to Jesus. If you haven't trusted him, if he is not your Lord and Savior, then it's not for you. But here's what I would say. Why not make that decision now? And then come to the table. And so when we take the juice and we take the bread, we're thinking, oh my goodness, these are symbols of Jesus' blood shed for me. This is a symbol of Jesus' body broken for me, for my healing. And so we don't take it lightly. We examine ourselves. Hey, am I out of line with you, Jesus? Am I not following you in an area of my life? You come, you come humbly, thinking that through. And is there a relationship in this church where there's conflict that I need to resolve? Or is there relational hurt in my life that I need to be a peacemaker in? These are all things we consider before we come to the communion table. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for your great faith and trust in your heavenly Father that enabled you to to do what you did for us so that you can give us the gift of faith so we can live an unshakable life that can weather any life storm. And as we think about that ultimate sacrifice you made on our behalf, may our hearts be filled with just immense gratitude. And Lord, if there's any areas of our lives or any relationships in our lives that are not functioning the way that you would want them to or design them to, we pray that you would bring those to our attention and then you would empower us to have great faith and make changes and do things differently. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to today's teaching. Make sure to click subscribe for the latest sermons. You can find more information about Abundant Life Christian Fellowship and our upcoming events by going to alcfohio.org. Again, that's alcfohio.org. You can also stay connected with us on Facebook and YouTube. We hope you have a great day.